Hello, the practitioner here. Bachelor of Science student, chemistry major, mathematics minor, magician, and uh, parapsych researcher. I took a I watched your video of uh, uh, describing your experiences of uh, telepathy, and one of the things is that um, I'm not going to automatically discount your experiences. Like I'm not going to, um, and, uh, but I will say that I'd say that perhaps they may be real. Who knows? They may be the start of a good place for scientific investigation. As Paul Kurtz uh, wrote, um, I suggest that rather than rejecting eyewitness accounts of so many as unreliable, that he understand offhand the, suggestive, the subjective dismissal of another's experience is equally unreli um, unreliable. What is missing is a, uh, his attempt at understanding what is based upon the accounts. They are laden with the complexity of personal observation. That they are laden with the complexity of personal observation does not mean that the underlying phenomena are not actually actual and real. The confusion of the scientist is out um, uh, is in sorting co out complex evidence does not itself uh, render the phenomenon unreal. It only means that the scientist mu lacks the insight or the tools to do the work. Only a fool of a scientist would dismiss the evidence and, rep uh, and reports in front of him and substitute his own beliefs in their place. Um, now, what that's saying is that um, not automatically that your things are unreliable, but that maybe that there are factors in there which have not been considered. Um, I'd like to go through your experiences one at a time, and um, if I may, present a slightly skeptical point of view. Again, just possibly to elaborate, um, if you will, you know, just some other things for further consideration. Uh, again, since I noticed that there were no comments of that sort on your um, on your uh, video, um, the first one is, of course, um, meditation. You uh, you were, of course, quite clear that the um, you were, of course, quite clear that you were in meditation, um, a walking meditation, when you felt this guy, uh, when you saw this guy coming towards you, and then you got this impression that he was looking for key food. Um, that's actually one of the more interesting things. Um, now, the only thing which I have to know about that is, well, how many other stores are in the area, and um, you know what would be in particular that he's looking for. And the thing, of course, is though, is that um, now maybe this is a little bit of a far-fetched statement on my point. Um, but you did say that the guy did seem, uh, uh, again, you got this guy coming towards you and he looked as a bit of a threat, uh, but then you got this impression that he was speaking, uh, looking for key food. He was just, you know, that it was common, he was just looking for something. Well, or looking for key food. Well, the thing is that you were looking at the guy, and the, um, there is certain body cues to um, convey that you are, that you are uh, anxious or looking for something or something like that. Like, we all exhibit those body cues. And the thing is that, um, I'm not going to discount meditation for one thing, because meditation um, is known for um, being able to still the mind. Uh, again, and there is medical proof of this, of endorphins released and you know of calming down the autonomic nervous system and the like, um, which would mean that the that the senses might act, that uh, awareness of the existing senses, you know, the normal five that we work with, might actually be heightened. So you might well have picked up body cues on that part. Um, as for key food. Well, it is possible, and again, note that I am suggesting that maybe my um, alternative explanation is slightly far-fetched in light of the fact that you might not necessarily, you know, not unreasonable, but slightly far-fetched, that um, you might, that he might have, act, you might have deduced that he was looking for key food because key food is one of the biggest, uh, st uh, one of the biggest uh, store chains in the area, or, you know, one of the biggest, you know, one of the most obvious uh, store uh, stores in the area that you know people would be commonly looking for in that particular area, i.e. the supermarket. So of course, if he's looking, you know, if he's looking anxious, and you've just, you know, and you know that key food is a big area, perhaps in your mind, you made that connection, um, and by some sheer, uh, you know, you made that as possibly the most likely connection, um, you know, just by a, a sheer jump, and then by a coincidence, you happen to be right. Now, of course, it is a little bit more complicated than. Um, apparently than telepathy but then of course you have to ask the question well what is the physical mechanism by which uh, what is the mechanism which allowed for you to experience the telepathy in and of itself or it could just be a coincidence um, you know again you know my point being is that I'm not discounting your experience I'm just simply curious as to the cause um, again telepathy in and of itself um, even though we've described it as an ability and granted there are plenty of studies out there and for people who uh, you know, which have apparently replicated this, um, you know, and certainly give the idea that there is further that needs to actually be discussed. Um, and for people who are actually looking for that, um, I've posted links on other videos and stuff like that for plenty of knowledge on that particular issue. Um, 
you know, I would consider that this particular experience. Um, my point is, is that from experiences like these, and the same goes with the, um, the same goes with the, uh, uh, with the card running and the and your friend Paul. I mean, uh, granted, you know, you might have muttered something, you know. I mean, like, the point is, is that I'm not going to discount your experiences. My point is, is that like with a lot of anecdotal evidence, um, I think that a lot of skeptics, and this is one of the things I want to stress, is that I think that a lot of skeptics, um, you know, just simply dismiss it as unreliable due to faulty memory or what have you. But the thing is that I think what the more important issue about anecdotal evidence is that it's too hard to tell. Now, on the issue of your um, where you worked with your friend, where you were the receiver and he was the sender, and um, you got the first five playing cards out of a mix of three decks, you said. Um, you, you mixed up like three decks or what have you. Um, and the first five were automatically accurate, and then you guys lost concentration. Um, the first five accurate out of a single deck um, would be... Um, oh, let me think. Actually, hang on. i got to run a calculation here just to be safe. Okay, let me see. Um, let's see. Is it still one out of 52? Because, you know... Uh, strictly speaking, it still should be one out of fifty-two. Oh, dang it! Hang on, I gotta run a calculation on this because this is gonna bug the crap out of me. Um, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll um I'll get back to you on this one. Um, I gotta double check with the statistics professor on this one just to be on the safe side. But um, if my understanding of this is correct, yeah. Well, the thing is that basically um, the fact that you mix three decks together. Now, technically speaking, the fact of getting any one of those cards should still be one out of fifty-two. But the thing is that um, the fact that you're dealing with a closed deck system, so the fact you flipped over the first consecutive five, I will admit that's unlikely. But again, the um, while that does seem to be like a highly unlikely event, the thing is that I'm not entirely too sure if the statistics of that are actually significant, so to speak, or if they are significant, I'm not entirely too sure on the technicalities of that one, and you should probably run that one by a statistics professor, or run that through a statistical calculator just to be on the safe side. Um, yeah, so like I said, just run that one through a statistical calculator or talk to a stats professor on that. Um, you know, tell him tell him what the scenario was uh, about that, and, um, you know, uh, and once you've done that, you know, actually have him run it through for you and tell you what the, uh, what the likelihood is, because uh, I think it's like there's a uh, a compounded less probability of each time, and the fact that you've got like uh, three possibilities for uh, the fact that you've had three um, of those cards, like you know, that might increase the probability overall of picking that individual type of card. So you know, that might um, you know, so that might affect it. Um, but like I said, nonetheless, um, I would admit that even even with those factors taken into account, um, the fact that you've got five playing cards consecutive right in a row, um, I will admit that is statistically highly unlikely. Um, even with one deck, let alone with three. Um, again, I think the overall would still be 1 in 52 per each. No, 1 in 52 opened if you had the... Yeah, either way, bottom line is those that that is still fairly highly unlikely. But nonetheless, um, again, it could still be considered a fluke. And uh, for the playing cards, here's what I'd suggest. Do that with one deck as opposed to three, so this way you've got it in a much clearer aspect. And then, um, and then run through as many cards as you can. And uh, in a closed deck system, and then um, you know calculate the one in fifty two by one in you know by one in uh, you know one in forty nine by one in fifty one by you know do the um, do the remaining uh, probability calculation down the list, and um, you should find it actually quite interesting. Um, you know, just take a look at take a look at what it's actually going to be like. You know, um, get a statistics professor to take a look at that for you. Um, you know, I mean, like, if you can do it under those, uh, under more controlled conditions over a, lot, a much larger period of trial where you can get something statistically significant, who knows? That may actually be something to it. Um, I would recommend tightening the controls, of course. Um, you know, keep the sender in another room or, uh, or in another place or, you know, or have, a, you know, have your friend out of town while you're in one room and then have the two of you uh, converse via instant messenger system, have the sender videotaped, um, you know, again, text-based only, and keep the chat logs as a um, you know as a reference to that and to then just videotape your side as well just to prove that or just have him videotape his side just to prove that there's no um, voice chat being involved here. But other than that, um, yeah that shouldn't be a problem. So yeah. Um, but other than that I would say, like I said, I think your experiences are the basis for something, you know. Granted they are statistically significant, uh, or granted they appear to be, you know, really highly correlative or stuff like that, but they're just 
on the basis of anecdotes, I think that you need to explore them further. That's just my thoughts, though.